What a pleasure to be back here since being here in 1990. Never mind. A lot has changed. And before I get into what has changed and what needs to be done, I want to talk a little bit about my family, because uh, I've been told that when I speak to audiences, I kind of owe you that. My grandfather, R.J. Reynolds, founded the company in 1875. He didn't know how dangerous tobacco would be, didn't know that it would kill hundreds of millions of people. And he uh, began marketing camels in 1918, made a fortune. And I wrote a book about my family, uh, together with Tom Shackman, a great biographer. It's called The Gilded Leaf. And uh, it's quite an interesting read if you want to know all the more about my family, because they are in, it's available used <laughs> for a penny, I think. <laughs> but it did get great reviews in the New York Times and the Washington Post. So The Gilded Leaf is, tells all the, the juicy story of the Reynolds biography uh, with all the color which I'm not gonna get as heavily into today, but you'll get a sample from these pictures. My father was a naval uh, navigator in World War II, and uh, he married four times. My mother was an actress under contract to Warner Brothers. He draped her with rubies and emeralds. He was madly in love with her. She was the second of his four wives. And there I am in 1904. <laughs> 1948, actually, never mind. Now, I'll get more to what I want to talk about. My uh, parents got divorced when I was three. And I didn't see my father again until I was like nine. So six years passed. And finally, I, and I needed him and I missed him. A quick show of hands, how many of you grew up without your biological fathers living at home with you? So I see some of you share the sadness that I went through. And I don't know how you feel about it, but when the AARC had me speak at a middle school yesterday, yesterday morning, you know, I told them that I want you to get in touch with your hearts, open your hearts, and are you angry that your father wasn't there for you as much, or sad, or afraid, it's all okay. Because, and then when you talk about your feelings, you become powerful communicators. I'm a communicator, that's what I do. And when I talk from my heart, with my passion, I will be heard, and all of you will be heard when you talk from your hearts as well. If I just stood up here and flowed you a lot of information, uh, you'd probably go to sleep. So talking from your heart is powerful. They called me Sad Sack. And uh, there I am in front of the fire department of New York, uh, you know, Cadillac, a brand new Cadillac in the 50s. And finally I wrote him a letter and I said, Dear Dad, I want to meet you. Where are you? And he sent for me, and there I am on one of his big Delta jets. When he was young in the 1920s, he was interested in airlines and aviation, and he uh, had a passion for planes, so he put his money in airlines, of course, and you know, there he was the biggest stockholder of Delta in 1958. One of the planes took me up to his private uh, estate. He had a 12-mile long island off the coast of Georgia. This time it was an estate in North Carolina. And there is the guy that I found. When the big moment came, and they showed me into the room where he was, I found him there lying down, and I said, Ted, what's wrong? I have asthma, son. He thought it was asthma. It turned out to be emphysema. And I only got to see him about five times after that, and every time I saw him, he was increasingly sick, frail, counting the time that he had left to live. He died when I was 15. And that had a big impact on me. And it really was part of why I would later choose to turn my back on my heritage, on the fortune, and walk away. And I vowed that I would do everything in my power to connect with young people, especially, to prevent them, to urge them to not start smoking. And I speak at a lot of middle schools and high schools. A number of respiratory therapists have convinced their hospital marketing departments to bring me to their communities. Uh, and in small to medium-sized media markets, I do get some good news coverage. And we bring the tobacco-free message to the whole community. 
where I speak. And more importantly to me, the kids get a great message. One day I'd like to go to China and Russia and India and bring the message to a whole nation. And I founded the Foundation for a Smoke-Free America and to the website tobaccofree.org, uh, and I'll do this work the rest of my life. Now, John Bradshaw, the great psychologist and family therapist, has written books, author. He says, America is a nation of addicts. We're not just addicted to one thing. We are polyaddicted. We're often addicted to two, three, four things, tobacco, alcohol, food, pleasures of the body, pleasures of home and comforts, coffee. Some of these addictions are pretty deadly. And he says it's all about avoiding our pain. We don't want to feel our pain. So what I'm going to do now is um, initiate you. I'm going to initiate you into life. And I do this at the high schools. Thousands of years ago, the elders of the tribes would take everyone out into the forest or the desert and they would make them uncomfortable. They would put obstacles in their paths. They would deprive them of food or sleep or give them a ritual wound. I don't tell that to the kids because there's too much piercing and tattooing going on. <laughs> but it's as though they want to be initiated with all that. It was done in every tribe and every continent. And I could never understand, why did the elders hurt the kids? Why did they give them pain? And one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I got it. They're saying, until today, you've been a child. And we adults have tried to shield your young eyes from the pain and the evil people, the tobacco executives and the congressmen who take money from big tobacco and then get in the way of regulating e-cigarettes. There are bad people in the world, yes, and as we gently open your eyes to the bad in this world, we also want to let you know that this world and this life, this mortal coil, can bring you pain. One day, a grandparent may die, hopefully when you're in your 50s, and it hurts. A parent may die, and it hurts us adults, I tell them. And my question to you today is, and I think the elders of every tribe in ancient times were saying to the kids, our question to you is when life gives you pain, and it will give you pain, how are you going to handle it? Like the uninitiated adults out there, are you going to go to a bar and drink because you don't want to feel your pain? Aw. Oh. You're going to light a cigarette because you don't want to feel the pain of nicotine withdrawal? Are you going to take drugs that will destroy your lives? because you don't want to feel your pain. The message here, ladies and gentlemen, is face your pain. Deal with your pain. Talk to someone about it. A trusted friend, a parent, a loved one, a spouse. Because people who reach out to other people succeed best in life. And that's the message I deliver over and over in my talks to the kids. So now with that, I initiate you into life and face your pain. We'll deal with it together. Now, let's talk about some tobacco milestones. We've seen U.S. per capita cigarette consumption uh, go way down from when I spoke here in 1990. The per capita consumption was around 2,800 cigarettes a year. Now it's down to 1,068 per year. So we've seen a huge drop off in smoking. We've seen a 58% decline in smoking rates from its high in 1965 to the present day 17.8%. We've seen a huge tidal wave of laws banning smoking in public that we fought hard for every one of them over the years. Laws prohibiting smoking in in restaurants and first and first municipalities and later whole states were banning smoking statewide. In Europe, even whole countries have banned smoking statewide. The reason for this success was the Surgeon General's report on secondhand smoke, which provided concrete scientific evidence that secondhand smoke kills and causes lung cancer and heart disease in non-smokers.
So we now have 30 states that have passed these laws. We've got 20 more to go, folks. And 65% of the population is now covered by uh, smoking bans. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is the real Marlboro country. We have dramatically increased tobacco taxes. That's the second uh, big factor in the drop-off in U.S. smoking. We've seen a huge increase in tobacco taxes over the years. And interestingly, we'll come back to this. But tobacco taxes stop kids from starting. They get people to quit. They save on long-term health care costs. I mean, on and on. The benefits of a tobacco tax are incredible. And yet some people just don't like any taxes at all. And you'll notice that uh, the cheaper cigarettes are, the lower line, at the, on the, well, the cheaper cigarettes are, there's an inverse proportion to the rate of smoking. So the cheaper cigarettes are, the higher the tobacco increase, uh, you know, the rate of smoking you see. One of the things Obama did two weeks after taking office was give us a 69 cent increase in the federal tobacco tax. We have three million fewer U.S. smokers because of it. We have tobacco sales down 11% after just a year. We have an immediate 11 to 13% drop in teen smoking. Wow! And we have a million eight seventy three kids who will not become smokers. Smoking deaths avoided because of Obama's tax on tobacco passed two weeks after he took office, 909,000. Long-term health care savings, 43.9 billion. We tried to get the tax passed under Bush. And we'll come back to that. Eight years, every year, no new taxes. We heard it over and over. High school smoking trends, incredible. We've seen a 57% decline in high school smoking since 1997. Wow, incredible. And part of that is due uh, to the state spending on tobacco prevention campaigns. States who do not spend the money on tobacco, tobacco prevention and cessation, have a higher rate of teen smoking. It follows uh, immediately. Practically, there's just, when there's low spending on tobacco prevention and cessation, we see a higher rate of kids smoking. So in summary here, our wins came from higher tobacco taxes, increasing prevalence of smoking bans, spending on tobacco prevention and cessation, uh, including the mass media campaigns, you see TV ads, like the tips from former smokers, which is now in danger. Regulation of the manufacturing and marketing and sale of tobacco products. You know, the graphic warning labels, wonderful stuff. Whether our First Amendment uh, protects the tobacco industry's right to not make speech it doesn't want to make is the, the question there. But the, tobacco, the First Amendment, you know, really is what has protected tobacco advertising. And going back, there's a little-known law that says that corporations passed in the... 19th century, for God's sake. Corporations have the same rights to free speech as private citizens. Corporations are people. So therefore, the Supreme Court has to say that the tobacco company's rights for free speech, with all its marketing and advertising, are protected under the First Amendment. I disagree, because I think we should repeal that law. Corporations are not people, and we need to consider the fact that uh, corporate speech, advertising, you know, $9 billion a year in the case of the tobacco industry today, advertising is quite different than a guy that gets up on a stage and says, the sky is purple and the clouds are green. So that's a different kind of speech. And let's remember what our Constitution intended uh, to protect the people. So all of those things there have one thing in common. They're all either government taxes or government regulations. They are policies. 
And ladies and gentlemen, we stand on the edge of a precipice today. In troubled times, I'm here today to remind you that the most dangerous and horrible leaders of the that world has ever seen were elected in troubled times and rode to power, swept to power on an oversimplified solution, an oversimplified ideology. So the ideologues in government who say no taxes, no new taxes, no regulations, need to be kicked out of office because it is those congressmen and those people who are stopping our efforts to reduce smoking at every single turn. I'm thinking maybe with my heart more than my brain today. They say the bigger your heart, the smaller the brain. <laughs> the bigger the brain, the smaller the heart. We live in complex times, complex problems. And most of us don't have the, the time to look at every single problem in its full complexity. So we're very vulnerable to, oh yeah, don't tax and don't regulate. It's an oversimplified ideology. And I'm worried that it's going to lead to some very bad, dangerous government. So remember those words. We need from our leaders less ideology, more pragmatism. If you're a Republican, call your elected officials and say, we agree, and I agree, Taxes and regulations slow the economy. They are bad for the economy. But let's make a surgical strike on tobacco, a surgical strike, and pragmatically look at every single problem one by one on a case-by-case -case basis and pass good laws versus laws based on a sweeping ideology that uh, is so dangerous for our nation. Thank you. I thought about running for Congress. <laughs> but it'd be a good stump speech, but I, I, I hesitate. It's scary enough being up here, you know. What slows our progress? We made the point. The tobacco industry at every turn. They have spent more on lobbying than almost any other business. Since 1998, Altria, Philip Morris, has spent more on lobbying than almost everyone, every other type of business. They spent a million six uh, in contributions to federal candidates last year. 80% went to Republicans. And there are some bad Democrats, too, and some very good Republicans, like John McCain. Love John McCain. 16.6 million uh, in tobacco industry expenditures lobbying Congress. And then they have gotten involved in paying for these huge advertising campaigns to defeat ballot measure after ballot measure, to rather to raise a tobacco tax uh, or pass a smoking ban in Ohio. We still won, thank God. I went and stumped in five cities in Ohio to promote that smoking ban. And we made front section page news coverage in every city I gave a press conference in. And the voters got wise and they voted the right way on that. But the tobacco industry was spending a fortune to defeat that smoking ban or that tobacco tax in that state. 125 million to defeat a federal bill sponsored by John McCain. They didn't want that. It was one of the s settlement proposals for the lawsuits by the states to recover the cost of Medicare and Medicaid years ago, which resulted finally in a $240 billion settlement paid over 25 years. The problem with that was that the tobacco industry lawyers made sure there was some fine print in that resolution, that settlement, providing for the $240 billion to the states over 25 years to recover the costs of Medicare and Medicaid. None of the money had to be spent on tobacco prevention and control. And all of us on our side said, well, hey, of course they're going to spend it on tobacco prevention and control. And guess what? They didn't. And they haven't. They did it first, and then it began to get cut. Some of the states even securitized their payments. Florida did a great thing. Florida didn't securitize its payments to pay down their budget deficit for that particular year, as so many states did. Florida put their settlement from the tobacco industry into a trust fund, and it has to be used for tobacco prevention and cessation. And every year, yeah. 
Uh -huh. Every year. Florida is now spending like $70 million a year uh, on tobacco prevention and cessation. It's not, you know, the CDC says they should spend $200 million, but seven, $70 million is better than a poke in the eye compared to what most of the other states are doing. So in summary, we need campaign finance reform in Washington to stop this kind of lobbying. And, you know, John, Mc, uh, rather John Boehner, former House Speaker in the 90s, was recorded and seen passing out checks from big tobacco on the House floor. It was such a blatant, uh, blatant bad form. Passing out checks, for campaign contributions from big tobacco to his colleagues on the House floor. Few people know that. And last July, hopefully we'll come back to that, he's put in language along with Mitch McConnell and the other Republican leadership into a bill that will make it very hard for the FDA to come down on e-cigarettes. All the candy flavorings like cotton candy and gummy bear that appealed to kids will remain grandfathered in thanks to John Boehner and the Republican leadership's language. They've also said in that language of the House Appropriations Bill that e-cigarettes can remain on the market until such time as it's proven that they're dangerous. Well, folks, it takes 20 to 30 years to get the disease that tobacco causes. We won't have reliable data on e-cigarettes and the vapors that they contain for decades, so they're gonna remain on the market. The good news is that this House Appropriations Bill has to go to the Senate, and I hope to heavens uh, and to Obama and that they're gonna take that language out and just hope that they don't just pass an appropriations bill to get it passed, leaving that language in. <laughs> Cost of tobacco, and I'm gonna fly through these because I have limited time, and I wish I had more, but uh, we were running late today. So, 170 billion annual healthcare costs. Six billion healthcare costs solely from secondhand smoke. $956 per household tax burden, $151 billion productivity lost, and $19.16 is the per pack cost for healthcare and productivity lost, and that's a low estimate. We have 480,000 deaths in the year, uh, a year in the U.S. now from soap smoking and secondhand smoke. We have 16 million people with, in the U.S. with smoking-caused illness. 2,500 kids trying smoking for the first time each day. Now, e-cigarettes have passed that by a margin, a wide margin. Internationally, we've got 100 million deaths in the 20th century. 100 million people died from tobacco in the last century. Six million deaths from smoking annually. A billion deaths in the 21st century if present trends continue. 14,000 deaths daily, one every six seconds around the world today. The tobacco companies began aggressively marketing their cigarettes in third world countries where people were poorly educated and didn't know how dangerous tobacco was. It was prestigious to have an American tobacco brand. And smoking increased like 73% uh, in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Take a quick look at tobacco advertising. We can fly through these. This is a special edition of Camels, which they added candy flavorings and referenced alcoholic beverages, which I show these at the high schools because they're trying to make smoking look cool to kids. They know that almost nobody starts smoking after 19. Almost nobody. Winter mocha mint, warm winter toffee, pretty girl. Oh, add some flavor to your party, huh? Oh, okay. They're not targeting middle-aged folks. They've targeted women. African-American women, because they know that African-Americans smoke more menthols. So uh, there's another one, cool. And that's the most outrageous piece of advertising I've ever seen. And I explained to the kids that the First Amendment protects this. And hopefully one day we'll see that corporate speech is different than private speech. Uh, they use cartoon characters, cute, adorable cartoon camel, the very essence of teenage rebellion. And that 
helped a lot of kids get smarter. All those ads are gone, by the way. Uh, seven states' attorneys general got rid of the candy-flavored cigarettes, and I'm appalled that the Republican leadership has added language grandfathering in the candy flavorings in e-cigarettes. It is outrageous. Feel my anger and the sadness. Smooth character. Mm -hmm. There's the real Joe Camel. Oh, and his friends, friends finally showed up for his funeral. So, let's take a look at what big tobacco is spending on advertising. They're still spending $9.6 billion a year. It's not the high, but a lot of that's in product discounting. $26 million every day. And only $490 million a year is being sent on prevent, preventing our kids from starting and cessation. Oh, and that, that $490 million that's down from uh, 717 million in 2008, but we all know what happened in 2008. The big economic collapse. Tobacco companies, in short, are outspending uh, us by 19 to one. So, oddly, the states are taking in 25 billion every year in tobacco taxes and uh, settlement, lawsuit settlement payments but they're only setting aside 1.9% of that for prevention and cessation programs. We're hoping, too, that the Affordable Care Act, that uh, we're going to see more smokers take advantage of uh, the provisions for quitting smoking and the products that you know, could be provided by that. So 15.7% of high school students smoke today. 7.5% of high school students in Florida smoke today. How come the rate here is half? Let's take a look. It's one of the lowest rates ever. Florida has a long-running and well-funded tobacco prevention program. It's not their tax because their tax is like, I think, 29th or 33rd lowest in the country. Florida's spending almost 70 million a year. Uh, CDC says it's got to spend $194 million a year to do it right. We've got a billion six coming into the state every year from uh, tobacco taxes and the lawsuit settlement payments. We got $1.33 tobacco tax. It's the 29th lowest in the country. So it, I think it has to do with the prevention, the huge prevention campaign still going on in Florida today. If every state in the country followed Florida's, you know, lead and at least raised their tobacco taxes to be similar to Florida's, at least raised the proportion per capita spending on prevention and cessation similar to Florida's, we would see seven million kids alive today. If the rate nationally went to 7.5 percent, seven million kids alive would not become smokers. 2.3 million kids would be saved from premature deaths, and we'd save 122 billion a year in healthcare costs in the future. Battery, okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a bleak picture. Only two states are funding these programs at CDC recommended levels, and only five states fund them at even half of what they should be for an effective program, according to the CDC. So Florida is a challenge to the rest of the country. I think today we'll let Florida stand as a shining example of tobacco prevention, better far than most of the other states, even though, according to the Lung Association, they don't get a good grade for their spending. It should be closer to the 200, 200 million. TV spots are effective in reaching teens. Uh, here's one I love to run at the high schools. We'll just take a quick look. If it starts, if not, I'm going to skip it because I want to use my time for other stuff. We have a spot? Oh, I'm sorry. I went backwards. Let's just forget this spot because it's wonderful. The kid on this camera is going, I know what you did. You marketed a product 
as, as uh, addictive as heroin to teens under 13. Blah, blah, blah. And it's pure power. We need to get that on TV and others like it. Let's talk about quitting smoking because I wanted to tell you today, as respiratory therapists, you can save lives when you intervene with your smoking patients. You really can save lives. If a patient has failed at quitting, and I would put this out front first and foremost, because yeah, I used to smoke. I failed 11 times at quitting. I tried every program in the book. I finally used aversion therapy through the Schick Center, and that's what got me off, partly. But there wasn't a product. It was more I came to the understanding that I couldn't have that one cigarette after two or three months. If a patient has failed at quitting, let them know that most smokers do fail several times, according to the studies. It's normal to fail. Don't get an idea that you can't quit. Remind them you can do it. It's part of the normal journey, your past failures, to becoming a non-smoker. Suggest to your patients they get into a program. People who su succeed best get help. Real men ask directions. <laughs> therapies accepted by the mainstream medical community. What are the therapies that work and that are approved by the mainstream body of science? Counseling, group, individual, phone. There's a wonderful 800 number out there. Hello, thank you, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. 1-800-QUIT-NOW, it's all over the country. It's funded by the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program in your state. And it's a great, they have live phone counselors, they send you a quit. I love the website, and I don't have it on my PowerPoint, becomenxex.org. That's from the American Legacy Foundation, the $2 billion foundation set up with about a percent of the $240 billion settlement by the states. Becomenx.org is a great quit smoking program and system, and it's free. The five mainstream medical community approved products are mainly nicotine replacement, the gum, the patch, lozenge, inhaler, spray. And two non-nicotine replacement, varenicline and bupropion. And contraindicated for pregnant women and not, no reliable data that it's gonna work for adolescents, smokeless tobacco users, or light smokers. Combining, the science says that combining phone counseling and group counseling is useful. So phone counseling with the group counseling, yeah. Combining two medications is often useful under a doctor's supervision. And combining the counseling with the medications is the most effective way to go. So tell your patients that. People who succeed get help, get in a program. 95% of smokers who quit with no program go back to smoking within 12 months. And with the even just nicotine replacement, I think it's like 85% fail and go back. But let's look at the glass of water being half full. It's, you go from 5% success to 15%. You triple your chances if you get in a nicotine replacement program, for example. Do I have time for this? Okay, well, no, I'm going to skip it. I was going to have everyone stand up and... Breathe, your respiratory therapist, but we're going to pass on, I'm going to let you off the hook on that one. <laughs> but it's the most powerful single thing in quitting smoking. <sighs> the breathing. When you want a cigarette, your patient has to... <sighs> and it's powerful. You get focused, and the urge to smoke dissipates. Quickly, e-cigarettes, we can't go through all this. I've got to want to get to the end of my talk. Uh, tripled among youth in one year, in 2013 to 2014, e-cigarette usage tripled, tripled. And 10% of teens, most alarmingly, who have never smoked a cigarette, have tried an e-cigarette. That's a bad sign, folks. E-cigarette flavors, we know the, all the flavors, uh, bad stuff in them, lead, and cadmium, chromium, arsenic, benzene. You know, are they less dangerous? Maybe. But I tell people when I do a, like a CNBC or a CNN interview, or Fox News Channel, that it might be like jumping off the fifth story instead of the tenth story. 
starter kits. We're going to fly through the blue, zoned by R.J. Reynolds. Problems, no regulation. Congress is now setting up roadblocks, thanks to the Republican leadership. Vapor contains carcinogens. If you're a Republican, call your congressman. Tell him, come on. Get that language out of the House Appropriations Bill. Protecting e-cigarettes, come on. The vapor contains carcinogens, unknown, unknown long-term impact on health. Explosions are happening. People, one blew up in somebody's face. It was a, the wrong battery charger for the e-cigarette, but the, it exploded and burned at the guy's the teenager's face. And poisonings, if you drink a little vial of that concentrated nicotine, smoke juice, as it's called, you die. And bad thing to have around kids because they smell like candy and bubble gum. It's annoying. It's scary. So we talked about the Appropriations Committee, uh, talked about the Republican leadership. There are some ads for e-cigarettes. They're using the same playbook as they used to use for big tobacco. We got all these male role models, Marlboro Man types, strong, powerful, independent women. Uh, even one ad said healthier, and they pulled that one off. <laughs> they pulled that one off the market, though, happily. Government did that. Thank you, government. Chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco, we're going to quickly fly through this. They started it with baseball players. It's still a big problem. We got 14% of high school kids using it, a lot less girls. That's what I show them, the kids. There's a guy. These are speakers that speak at schools, too, like I do. And they're wonderful. There's Rick Bender. And they're powerful testimonies. And I tell this story of Sean Marcy. I got don't have a lot of time, but very briefly, I cut to the point when Sean, is at the age of 18, has contracted can mouth cancer. He's had part of his tongue amputated, part of his jaw removed, uh, part of his nose removed, a tube going up in his mouth, his nose, for, to feed himself. And in this moment in the story, one day Sean heard the phone ring, and he heard his mother pick up the phone in her, her room like she always did. And a little while later, she came into the room with an ashen white face and she looked at him and she said, son, that was the doctor. This is the end of the story. It's a long story. He said the cancer is still spreading. You have, there's nothing more they can do. And Sean Marcy had never once cried. And in that moment, the great Sean Marcy, track star who won 27 medals in track competitions, broke down and he wailed in his mother's arms and she held him. And not long after that, at the age of 19, he died from chewing tobacco. And we take a look and we'll remember you, Sean. Powerful thing to show kids in schools. And I contacted Sean's brother who sent me these high resolution pictures which we've never had before, so I've made them available to the public now. I think that our kids are worried about the future. Came across a study in the 90s that said, our kids do not have faith in the future. They're worried. It's understandable. And I believe that because they're worried about the future, if a child thinks that there's not much future out there, well, they're more prone to high-risk behaviors like smoking, drug use. And I want to encourage those kids. And when I stand up in front of them, I tell them, if you have those worries, fears, and doubts, talk to somebody, a trusted teacher, the school counselor, your friends, your parents. Talk, and we will connect. We will get through it together, whatever the problem is. Yes, we live in a difficult time with the threat of a terrorist attack at home, with, gosh, uh, new diseases, SARS, bird flu, AIDS, swine flu, whatever. We will find cures for those diseases, I tell them. The economy may collapse again. Will there be a job out there for me? Yes, there will. The economy has collapsed before, and it historically always came back and I invite them to look on the other side of that. To catch my faith. I have this rock solid faith that there are wondrous things coming in your lifetime. 
and you will need your health in the years ahead of us because you will need every precious bit of your health, so don't smoke and don't, don't use drugs that will destroy your life. Catch my faith. The future's looking fine. If we have any bumps, we'll get through them together, and on the other side of it, marvelous things are coming. I got the faith. I want to close my talk today with a promise that one day I have a vision that we will have a tobacco-free society, a society free of drugs. I believe in people. I believe in America. I believe in people around the world. We will have one day a time maybe even in some of our lifetimes, when the parents will be there longer for their children. And smoking will be no more. We look back to smoking on planes, and we say now, hey, did they ever smoke on planes? I testified in Congress to, that was one of the many people that helped get that first two hour ban. One day, we're going to look back and we're going to say, did people ever smoke? And ladies and gentlemen, it's coming because of you. The tobacco-free society is becoming coming because of you. And you're caring about this issue. And I believe in you. Our goals in tobacco control are to raise the purchase age to 21, to increase the average tobacco tax around the states. Some of them are still average tobacco state tax is 48 cents a pack. If you, all the rest of the states are averaging about $1.70 a pack state tax. New York has, I think, $4.50 a pack. Yeah. And New York has one of the lowest teen smoking rates. We need to pass smoking bans, statewide ones in those 20 states that haven't done it yet. We need to counteract tobacco industry marketing with high-impact national media campaigns like the tips from former smokers run by the wonderful CDC, and I know you're here in the room somewhere here. We need to get those ads back on the air if they've gone off. We need the states to fully fund tobacco prevention programs, cessation campaigns from tobacco revenues at CDC recommended levels. So if we took this much the states are pulling in from tobacco taxes and settlement payments, and we're spending this much on tobacco prevention, we could go to here and reach the CDC recommended levels in every state. And it will make such a huge difference to our kids and to people that are struggling to quit smoking and can't afford the uh, medications. We need to remove the restrictions from the FDA's authority to regulate tobacco and e-cigarettes. Get that language out of this House Appropriations Bill. Please call your representatives. And if you want to take action, there's my website, tobaccofree.org. It's Patrick at tobaccofree.org. There. Easy to find. And the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids has a wonderful Take Action link. You can click on that and make a difference. We're going to have a smoke-free society, ladies and gentlemen. It's coming because of you and the work you're doing. Thank you very much.